This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. Very pleased to be joined by a special guest, a friend of mine, Hunter Hastings, who lives in my one-time hometown of San Diego, California and who is someone who has been involved for many, many years, both in entrepreneurship and in marketing as an executive working for big brands that you've heard of, like Coke and Procter & Gamble and Kraft and that sort of thing. So now in his second career of sorts, he has taken a particular interest in entrepreneurship, and he works with people like Professor Peter Klein and Professor Per Beeland in crafting and creating what we have as a new program, a new offering called Economics for Entrepreneurs. And many of you have probably already heard his voice on that podcast, which of course we feature at Mises.org. But I wanted to get together with him and talk a little bit more about the underlying Austrian economics that serves as a foundation of sorts for entrepreneurial activity. So all that said, Hunter Hastings, great to talk to you. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's great to be here. Well, I want to start with something that I discussed with Per Byland in an interview recently that we did for the Austrian magazine. And you know, Hunter, this criticism. This criticism comes from people like Nassim Taleb who say business schools and economics departments can't really teach business acumen. They can't teach entrepreneurship. You've either got it or you don't. So I I wanted to get your thoughts on that for starters. Well, I'd break that down, Jeff, into three components. One is there's a process of entrepreneurship, and that can be taught. And the problem is that most business schools and most uh, teachers of entrepreneurship get it backwards. And that's captured a lot in this idea of product market fit, which is a perfect illustration of getting the process backwards, developing a product or a service, and then figuring out how it fits into the marketplace. And the opposite is the right process, which is understand customers or consumers, understand the market that they make up, identify some need or opportunity which is unmet, and then design your product and service to fit into that that space in the the marketplace. So product market fit and most uh, business school teaching about entrepreneurship is backwards. And we can teach the right process. And we've had guests on our show talk about that. Uh, Kurt Carlson from a couple of weeks ago is a, is a great example of teaching that. So you can teach the process. You can, you can show people that. You can give them case studies and, and case histories. The second component is tools and tactics. And you can teach some of that. So you can teach financing, how to raise money, how to borrow money, what the meaning of debt is, what's a P&L, what's a balance sheet, how a growth company should think about that how to hire people, how to put teams together. We can certainly teach the principles of that. Uh, But some of the tools and tactics we can't. We talk a lot on economics for entrepreneurs about empathy, which is the the individual art of getting into somebody's heart and mind and understanding their needs. We can describe what what that is, but I'm not sure you can teach it. That's something that uh, is inherent. Maybe people can learn it over time, but I'm not sure you can teach it. And then there is a third element, which is personal attributes. And I, I believe that that's applicable in, in entrepreneurship. Uh, a word that comes up a lot is courage. If you're a small business owner and you're trying to make payroll, you're trying to sign the lease on your store, you're, you're trying to introduce a new product or a new service, you're trying to deal with a, with a client, a lot, a lot of times that requires courage or at minimum self-reliance. Uh, I like to call it individualism. The, the economists call it embracing uncertainty, which is, hey, you can't know what's going to happen, so you've got to have a pretty tough-minded approach to, to uh, embracing uncertainty or have a bias for action. So I think some of those traits uh, can be learned, but they can't necessarily be taught in school. So uh, that's a long answer to a short question. Well, it's funny, that third quality, we might have a different word for that that we won't use on air today. Mm. But when we talk about tools and tactics, I think sometimes we gloss over things like HR and finance and accounting. These are real skills that you can go learn in a class. And those are certainly important if you're going to be successful. Right. And I, 
I agree with you. We can we can teach those kinds of things, and we can especially teach them for entrepreneurs who are usually dealing with greater scarcity of resources, as the economists would say, than a big corporation like some of the ones you mentioned in your introduction. So how do I decide on those hires? How do I decide whether to add a marketing capability versus a another engineer? Those kinds of of issues, their resource allocation issues, their team building issues. We can teach the decision making that helps folks make the right decisions and allocate resources in the right way. So yeah, we wouldn't gloss over those kinds of things. They're they're very, very important. I see them every day in, in venture capital funded firms. It's a big issue. Now in your own work in venture capital, let me ask you a slightly personal question. Do you have skin in the game? You have your own money involved in some of the uh, firms in which you invest? Yes, in in two ways. One, I'm a general partner in the fund that I that I co-manage, so that's my money, as well as other investors' money. And then I personally invest in some of the the deals that come by. Not all of them, but but many of them. So yes, I have skin in the game. So at the outset, when you were talking about process, let's unwrap that a little bit more. It, embedded in a lot of what you were saying is the Misesian idea of consumer sovereignty. And what's interesting is, is Rothbard didn't particularly like that term. He, made, he thought it made it sound like the consumer was the boss of the producer rather than someone who is involved in a, a, a voluntary exchange with him. But nonetheless, I mean, talk about that. That seems almost entirely lost, at least when I watch things like, let's say, Shark Tank. People have some idea and it's more about them rather than the need of the consumer. So so what should we think about consumer sovereignty? Well, I'm a big subscriber to that idea. When I was at Procter & Gamble and I was marketing uh, soap and detergent and mundane sounding things like that, we investigated the need of the consumer. My particular uh, consumer was mom. I was marketing Tide. I needed to understand mom and help her to make decisions so she would she would buy my product as opposed to somebody else's. And we came up with the phrase, really Procter & Gamble did, I didn't, that the consumer is my boss. And so my boss was mom. And that was ingrained in us. That was our process. And so an economist like Ludwig von Mises calls it consumer sovereignty. We called it the consumer is boss. And it is absolutely applicable because it's the second part of Austrian theory, subjective value, that values in the mind of the consumer that helps you figure out how to meet, meet the needs of the customer who's your boss. So I got to the point where I understood that mom's subjective need, I never used any terminology or words like that, was she wanted to be a good mom. She wanted to feel that herself. And she wanted to have others recognize her as a good mom. And you can write all kinds of psychological uh, analytics around that, but it was absolutely true. And if I could communicate that Tide was helping her feel like a good mom, I was successful. And that's that's universal. That whole point is universal. So uh, we're actually doing a lot of new research now about where value is formed. And the business schools talk about value creation as if an entrepreneur creates value. Well, in fact, they don't. The consumer creates value and in a very complex uh, system of their life. And they invite you to fit in. And if you can fit into their life in a way that makes them more comfortable, makes them feel better, then they've created value from the offering that you've made. So... I am an absolutely strong believer in consumer sovereignty, and I think that's one of the great strengths of Austrian economics. That's what we keep trying to do on economics for entrepreneurs is make that link. The theory is customer sovereignty. What does it mean in real life? And if you understand that, you're way ahead. But talk more about value. That's difficult to understand conceptually. I mean, even Menger had a theory of value way back in the 1870s. He was talking about use value and exchange value and commodities and that sort of thing. But when we, when we say the value has been created, we, there's buzzwords like value added or what's my value in this meeting or whatever it might be. It's become buzzy. 
What do we really mean? Does the consumer experience value? Does the consumer create value? Does the, does the entrepreneur set the conditions for the consumer to attain value? How should we think about it? Well, you got the word exactly right, and that is the consumer experiences value. So it doesn't happen until they've, they've had that experience. And it's a feeling. That's what subjective value means. And in fact, if you go back and read Menge, you said this yourself when you reviewed uh, Principles of Economics on, on this podcast, it reads like 2019. It's all about subjective value and what the entrepreneur has to do to, to create that. So value occurs when the consumer or the customer consumes what the entrepreneur has offered, feels like that's better than they were before, and might be disposed to continue to consume or consume more or become loyal, all of those things that we use. But value is a feeling on behalf of the customer. And so that requires the entrepreneur to have what the economists call empathy, you get into people's lives. We had uh, Elizabeth uh, Isabella Neighbor, sorry, on, on our show a few weeks ago, and she talked about listening from the heart, which was a great expression about understanding how consumers feel value. And analytics and big data and those kinds of things, they can give you some pointers. You can, they can see patterns and they can, they can uh, give you some analytics that you can work on, uh, but they can't give you that emotional understanding of how the consumer is going to feel value. And it's subjective. It's also idiosyncratic. It changes all the time. It changes with context. It's a very elusive thing. So you can't create value. The consumer's got to understand it, or got, got to feel it rather. You've got to understand that feeling. And we say they, the entrepreneurs can facilitate value. They can make a value proposition. They can make an offer. And hopefully that will be hmm. experienced as value by the consumer. So it's very humbling uh, thought, and that's that's one of the uh, ideas that Mises had in human action. It's a humble idea. Well, it is humbling, but I want to think more about this facilitating the process for which you and, and values of feeling. That doesn't sound very econish, and I don't really like behavioral economics. <laughs> you know, and the idea that it, that something's a feeling. Let me give you an example. I don't know if people know this, but suede is generally very expensive. And now that you can get a uh, what they call ultra suede, uh, you can get it in a sport coat, for example, that's made of some kind of newfangled high tech polyester that has a look and feel and that sort of sheen of suede. And uh, I happen to have a suede sport coat that I really like. And I got a Facebook ping the other day of one that was very similar to it. And it, it, I had sort of a strange visceral reaction. I mean, I'm a pretty, I'm not a big shopper or consumer type. But it, I mean, that's that's pretty amazing because that's not even a human entrepreneur at that point. That's an algorithm, although a human built it somehow. So they got to me. I didn't buy it, by the way, but they got to me. So is that it? I mean, that feeling that I might value that that ultra suede sport coat more than the whatever the price was? Well, there are two parts to what you just described. And Entrepreneurs have to combine those two things. One is technical knowledge. So the ping that you described from Facebook is some human being somewhere wrote an algorithm that said, we can figure out how to send a ping to Jeff Deist about, about uh, suede sport coats since he's been seen in one or, or has written about them or something like that. That is technological knowledge. The second part of that is human knowledge. And the AI that sent you the ping has no idea how you feel. And so it can attempt to write some words that might uh, elicit some, some expressions of feeling from you. That's a kind of semantic analysis it can do. But you have to have the feeling that, boy, this new suede sport coat will make me feel better than the old suede sports coat. And you're creating that value. That's Jeff Dice doing that, not the, not the AI. So the two go together, the technological component and the human component, but the human component is all subjective, all human. But if that's where the value lies, and it's on the consumer side of things, and the consumer is sort of creating it, isn't that bad news for the labor theory of value? I mean, Marxists looked at things in, in terms of how much time they took, how many people, the, the cost of the inputs. And so 
isn't an, an entrepreneurial mindset almost by definition uh, contra Marxism? Oh, absolutely. I, no one equates cost with value anymore. Um, so creating value is entirely a, it's a conceptual idea. It's a theoretical idea. You can't measure it. You know, that Rothbard's famous about that. You can't, you can't measure, measure in utils or anything like that. You can't measure value. Uh, there's a proxy for it, which is price. Somebody might pay a certain price, but why does somebody pay $260,000 for the new Ferrari Roma as opposed to $35,000 for uh, a Ford? There's, there's lots of reasons why, most of them emotional, and the cost has relatively little to do with it. So I, you can't even relate those two concepts today, cost and value. They're, they're just not related. They're not in the same field. But do you think that's true? Do you think we really have defeated the concept of the cost theory of value or the labor theory of value? Or is that just in our circles where we think we've defeated it? Well, you're talking about circles of economists. I'm trying to talk about circles of entrepreneurs. So okay. yes, theoretically, it's it's totally defeated. Um, but that's not our concern. Our concern is is thinking about entrepreneurs. How can they create value? And the second step is I've got to organize costs. Uh, so that my cost is lower than value. It might be by a lot or it might be by a little. And so, again, going back to my my training when I was in the big corporations, the business schools used to, used to teach cost-based pricing. So figure out the cost of your ingredients, add 40%, and that's the price to the consumer. Well, I found out quickly it's the wrong way around. Again, it's backwards. The right answer is price-based costing. How much value does the consumer think they're getting out of, out of this offering that you're making? What's the price they will pay for that value? That's the proxy. Now organize your, your resources so that your cost is less than the price the consumer will pay, and that's called profit. So even cost-based pricing is the wrong way around. It's price-based costing. And Per Bylan talks about this with respect to iPhones. He says, you know, what's the next iPhone 10 or 11 or whatever number we're on? What's it going to cost? People immediately begin to talk about components and uh, how much development time Apple has into it and everything. And that's really irrelevant, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's going to cost what the market will bear. And, but, but I want to add to that. I want you to respond to this. Is cost does come into play. In other words, if the realities of, of – uh, payroll costs and materials costs become too high and the market simply won't pay, then a product might go away. So cost does play a role. Well, that's back to customer sovereignty again. The, the customer decides what the price is in the marketplace. And if you can't control your costs as an entrepreneur to keep them below that price, you don't make a profit, then you can't continue. So in that sense, cost is a responsibility of the entrepreneur that they might get wrong. The second part of it is Competition might come along and say, I can make that for less money. I can offer it at the same price and make a big profit, or I can offer it at a lower price and still make a profit. So the competitive function is, is very real in entrepreneurship. Now, what we try and make people think about is, can I get to the point of uniqueness where I really don't have any competition? My, my application is so specialized that I'm genuinely unique, and that's the ideal place to be. But it's a very hard place to be, and it's very hard to maintain in a, in a competitive marketplace. So cost is the responsibility of the entrepreneur. Well, there's also the point you made earlier comparing, let's say, a, a fancy high-end luxury car or a sports car that costs $250,000 to a thirty-five dollars or $40,000 Camry. I mean, you can reach a point where a, a Camry is half as good, but it costs a tenth as much. So again, there's, there's ranges of choices here. We don't all have to own the latest, greatest iPhone. We can own a five-year-old Samsung or something like that. Yeah, and the analytics of value to those two consumers are actually very, very hard. If you've got that Ferrari, what part of it is prestige? How much value are you putting on the prestige? How much are you putting on the tradition? How much are you putting on the brand? Why does a Louis Vuitton handbag cost $15,000? Because the consumer will pay that because they see that value in it. Can I understand that value perception on the part of the consumer? I can try really hard, but boy, that's got to be tough. I'm not a person myself who would spend 260 k on a Ferrari. So I've got to empathize 
with that consumer. I've got to think about what would the mindset be? What would the context be? What would the circumstances be that would make that value? And how many of those Ferraris can I make and sell if I'm Enzo Ferrari or his, or his uh, successor? Those are very, very delicate calculations. It's, it's not easy. But again, there are people, and let's just say on the left, who would resent the purchaser of the Ferrari, the Louis Vuitton handbag, saying you ought not to be able to to value the feeling you get from having a fancy car that much when there's uh, there's privation and starvation and such in the world, and we ought to spread that money around. Nobody ought to buy a Ferrari. So the idea of consumers creating value for themselves and the idea of consumer sovereignty are, are again sound like they have an ideological tinge to them because we're saying, hey, it's okay if you want a $15,000 Louis Vuitton handbag. That's what makes you happy. That gives you some sort of cachet. Knock yourself out. A lot of people don't agree with that, Hunter. Yeah, but there's no ideology in entrepreneurship, Jeff. So if the, the customer is boss, you try and understand what it is that they want. So maybe they want some superb piece of machinery. And as Mises explained, often in the beginning, the market invents new technologies or new designs or new ways of doing things for the very few who can afford them first. And there's an interesting concept in, in uh, that kind of economics, which is you want venturesome entrepreneurs, but you also want venturesome consumers and venturesome customers because they'll try the new technology first. And then eventually, if it catches on with them, then some new entrepreneurs will come in and say, whoa, that's interesting. Maybe I can make that valuable to more consumers. Instead of a, a $25,000 Rolex, I can invent the $35 swatch. And there's a lot of stops in between as well. So eventually it benefits everybody. And I've never understood the mentality that we shouldn't let our entrepreneurs try hard enough to create new value that's never been seen before because it always dissipates into the marketplace. In fact, there's never a huge profit in selling very expensive things to a few people. There's a lot of profit in selling very attractive things to a great number of people. Well, you mentioned that entrepreneurship doesn't have an ideology per se. Austrian economics is viewed rightly or wrongly as being steeped in theory and ideology, at least by some people. So when it comes to the process of teaching people or learning how to become a better entrepreneur. Uh, you see all kinds of online marketing. You see all kinds of business self-help books at the airport. There's a whole industry of podcasts and coaching and life coaching, all this sort of thing. I always sense that people don't want any ideology or theory snuck in. They, they really just want the nitty-gritty how-to. And sometimes it feels like uh, Austrian economics is encumbered with a lot of theory. Well, I'd separate those two things with a very, very thick, high wall. Theory is good. Theory is how we think about how the world works. And if we can get the theory right, then we can take that as a general principle and use the deductive method and figure out how it applies to our own individual business. So in our, in our new free ebook that we just released, with E4E, it's think better, think Austrian. That's not ideological, it's theoretical. So if you can think straight, if you can look at data and figure out based on general principles, truth principles, how those work, then you've got a better start. Then we talk about uh, developing knowledge. So Austrian economics has a lot to say about distributed knowledge. And for the entrepreneur, the implication of that is develop more and more specialized knowledge that you can bring to the marketplace and it's got extra value. Develop some skills based on that knowledge that other people don't have. Be multidisciplinary. Think across a lot of different fields when you're applying your, your knowledge. And then Austrian economics talks about imagining the future, which is the, just the best way of thinking about innovation. Imagine what it would be like and then think better about working your way backwards to how you can implement it. So all of those applications or applications of of theory ideology there's nothing to do with ideology we we look at the economy we look at it from the individual standpoint we look at it about individual serving individuals you roll that up into economic growth and betterment 
that's not ideology. That's just how the economy works. So I'd separate those two. I'd, I'd uh, give a big green light to theory and a big red light to ideology. Well, give us a couple of examples. You've, you've hinted at some. What are some examples of Austrian theory that has real-world applications for business or entrepreneurship? Well, I think we've talked about the two most important ones. One is customer sovereignty. So if you think your way through that, uh, that's, that's perfect for, for any business development. We've talked about subjective value. So, for example, the advertising industry is an exercise in subjective value. How can I communicate to a consumer that they will feel better as a result of trying or consuming my product? That's, that's the application of, of subjective value. But a third one that's really interesting that, that, that uh, Per and I have been talking about, or Dr. Byland, I should say, and I have been talking about a lot, is uh, the economic name for it is Austrian capital theory. And Austrian capital theory says your capital structure, if you're a firm, should reflect the consumer's preferences in the marketplace. And the consumer's preferences are always changing. So how can you do that? How can you, you flexibly build a, a capital structure that changes as fast as a consumer did? And for a long time, we never knew that. And then we've just finally started working our way towards that. So outsourcing is a way to have flexible capital. I'll make it with these outsourcing resources, but as soon as I need to change, I can, because it's a contract, not a, not a piece of fixed capital. And the latest thinking about agile, which is an organizational approach. Uh, Stephen Denning, who's uh, going to be coming on the program soon, wrote a book called The Age of Agile. And it says it changes the structure of the firm. Think of it not as a a big building or a machine, but think of it as a flotilla of tiny speedboats that is always peeling off and peeling in and, and going in lots of different directions. So how could you how can you build an agile company? Well, it's Austrian capital theory. And if you if you keep thinking about that, how can I make my capital and my resources as flexible as possible so I can turn this part off tomorrow and turn that part on tomorrow? That's a revolution in, in organization. So we've known this theory for a long time in Austrian capital theory, and we're just now learning how to apply it in real life. So it's super exciting, actually. It's exciting to figure out how to apply that. Well, one example I recall you pointing out to me is something like Uber, where they've built this company based on an app and an algorithm, and they've got uh, all these vehicles in play, and they don't, they don't own them. Their fleets were sitting out there already in people's garages, and they don't employ the drivers, and they don't uh, have to go out and find the customers. The whole thing was, was not only highly decentralized, but it, it just represents a new kind of company where it doesn't have to own physically all of the resources that go into the service it provides. Yeah, exactly. So Uber is a very... Uh as you say, decentralized and agile company, and the idea that the the benefit, the value to the consumer comes a lot through the app, through the software. Uh, somebody was telling me the other day that one of the great values that has appeared in research is that little algorithmic visual of the car getting closer and closer to you. So <laughs> all the idea of waiting for a cab and you don't know whether it's coming, you don't know whether it's yours, and you don't want the whether someone's going to push you out of the way, it's all replaced by that knowledge that is represented by the visual algorithm of the little car approaching. The capital is, as you say, owned by others, owned by the drivers and, and uh, dispersed all the way through the, the city or the country. So yeah, it's a great example. Another great example, I think, is, is Amazon. And in Jeff Bezos' seven uh, principles of running out, Amazon, maybe it's up to 13 now, maybe I'm not up to date. But anyway, one of them is customer obsession. And that's his way of saying Austrian customer sovereignty theory. So if you always think about the customer, if you're always obsessed about what the customer wants, then you're always going to make the right decisions. You're going to allocate resources in the right way. You're going to build your apps in the right way. And Amazon now is basically infrastructure. So there are third-party sellers on Amazon. There are people who are not employed by Amazon driving trucks and delivering your stuff. Um, it's a very decentralized 
operation from a capital standpoint, but it's highly, highly focused on the customer to an obsessive point of view. So I think that's another good modern example. But this has actually radically changed the structure of production itself, right? I mean, Austrian capital theory goes to the structure of production, how long it is and and how roundabout it is. But here uh, we have uh, resources that were lying fallow, for example, in, in the case of Uber in people's garages, and now they're being put to use, uh, albeit owned by someone else. So this really changes things, doesn't it? If we think of companies as highly decentralized versus the old IBM or, or Ford Motor Company that was sort of a hub and spoke and everything went through corporate at the top. Well, it's still very helpful to think about the production chain in the way that Menga did with higher orders of goods and lower orders of goods, and they're all connected through a, a chain of production. And the value of each one of those components, no matter where it is, is determined by how much value is created by the customer. So you continue to think like that. The difference is you don't have to own it. So you can build your supply chain from Alibaba in, in China and bring it to the US on some transportation company that's providing a service and you don't own. And then they'll get it to a third party warehouse or the Amazon warehouse. You don't have to arrange that. Somebody else will. Then Amazon will deliver it. And you've just got to focus on the value component of telling the customer that your product is available, what price you would like for it, and what its features and benefits are. So yes, it's changed the ownership of the capital, but no, it hasn't changed the idea of thinking through the production chain from higher order to lower order. But it focuses the entrepreneur on what do I do best? What do I do best is facilitate value for the customer with my my website on Amazon, with my communication on Amazon, on my own website. And I don't do what I'm least uh, able to do, which is which is build the original capital. So actually, it's a fabulous world for entrepreneurship now because it's it's so flexible. It's it's so dynamic. It's a great time to be an entrepreneur. Well, let's talk about the entrepreneur as an individual. This isn't always just some rich kid. Uh, this isn't always just somebody who lucked into a business. And this also isn't someone who's fungible. They aren't just a, an input, a widget that you can swap out with another human. The entrepreneur has a very special role to play. Obviously, Mises, Kirzner talked at length about this. So uh, talk more about that. Do other schools of economics really understand the, the role of the entrepreneur? And, and if not, you know, what is their conception of the firm? Is it flawed? Well, I'd break down the the uh, concept of the entrepreneur in, in two ways. The, the economic model, which, as you rightly say, is the entrepreneur's role in the economic system, in the beneficent economy. And that role is making the lives of others better. And that's pure economics. That's what, that's what entrepreneurs do. And Economists call it rearranging the factors of production. I'll find the need and I'll rearrange the factors of production, which means you invent something or you start up something or you're a marketer, you're an engineer, you're an you're a innovator, you can, you can be an intrapreneur or an entrepreneur. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you try to do that by making a profit. So that whole role of the entrepreneur, that exists in Austrian theory. It doesn't exist in, in mainstream theory. Because the mainstream looks at aggregates and mathematical equations, and there's none of the emotion and, and subjectivity that we have in Austrian economics. So, yes, that part of it is is an Austrian economics monopoly, if you like. Nobody else thinks that way. But then individually, the way I think about being an entrepreneur is being the best node you can be in the network that you choose to join. So we just described the the entrepreneur who sells on Amazon and what that network looks like when when you assemble it and you can certainly do that and you can you can play the best role and leave the other roles to others but you can do that if you're working for a company you can you can be on an entrepreneurial team trying to create value for customers you can do it as part of a small firm you can do it as part of a a, a group or a team and your job is to is to assemble that specialized knowledge that we talked about and apply that specialized knowledge in network interaction with with other people. So again, to quote uh, the age of agile, you call it the the law of the network. 
connecting yourself in a network in a way that produces value for for customers and consumers. I don't think other economics talk about that. It's uh, the theory of the firm is just not developed in mainstream economics. They think of it as the components of a market structure. So if there's a monopoly, there's one firm, there's an oligopoly, there's a few, and if there's perfect competition, there's an infinite number, presumably. But they don't actually think about people and acts of entrepreneurship and making lives better and, and facilitating value. It, that's got nothing to do with mainstream economics. Well, I think we should point out that even if you're not in an entrepreneurial situation per se, let's say you're just a, an employee at a, at a large company, there are all kinds of entrepreneurial things you can do within, in, within any environment to sort of sell yourself or learn more or market yourself or build up or develop within a firm. So you don't have to actually be starting a business of your own necessarily to think and act entrepreneurially. No, absolutely not, Jeff. The, firstly, always focus on the customer. Always think of the customer first. And modern thinking about the theory of the firm from a business standpoint rather than a textbook standpoint is everybody serves the customer. You've got to think about what am I doing that helps my customer feel better, have more convenience, experience more value. Even if you're an accountant in the, the cost department, try and think that way. Second, collaboration is a big part of entrepreneurship. So find out how you can work on teams. How can you contribute? The, the thinking about teams right now is to keep them small, keep them very specialized, have multiple disciplines on them, and have them work on a single end to get, get their job completed. And then you, you roll up the results of those teams into a a bigger project or a bigger division or a, a bigger outcome. So be a great team member. That's another way of being the best node you can be on the network you choose to join. And then pick up specialized knowledge as you go along. There's so much to to pick up. You know, when I think about my entrepreneurial career, I, I started a consulting company on global branding when I was in my late 40s, I think. And that's, you know, that's pretty typical for when people start companies. So I'd worked for um, Procter & Gamble in, in multiple countries, multiple categories. I then worked in other uh, large corporations with similar footprints. Then I worked in some consulting companies, and then I started my own. So by that time, I picked up knowledge about global branding in a lot of categories, a lot of countries, a lot of tactics, a lot of cultural experiments. So as a consultant, I genuinely had something to bring. I, took a while to accumulate that knowledge. So you can be doing that while you're working for a firm. And that's a, that's a great way to look at entrepreneurship. Keep developing knowledge until I'm ready. Well, the Economics for Entrepreneurs E4E project and the podcast itself, just tell us a little bit about them, where to find them, but, but also the goal. How do we deliver uh, at least some Austrian theory, applicable, actionable Austrian theory to people? And what's the format? How should people consume this? Because I'm sure some of our listeners are interested. And also, I, I view this long term as a project of the Mises Institute where, where the, it can almost be a sister podcast to the Human Action Podcast. We have the, the econ and the theory on one side and the application on the other. So just tell us a little bit more about how you conceive of this project. Well, you're right, Jeff. It's a long term project, which the the Mises Institute has, has uh, funded and authorized, and it's an exploration of how we can apply Austrian economics in business. And why should we do that? Well, we, we're trying to help people. We're trying to help people uh, become better entrepreneurs, but actually it's broader than that. You become more employable, become more promotable, become more fundable, become more successful if you're a small business owner. Anything that helps people in, in business using all of the applications of knowledge that we've been talking about for the, the past few minutes. And the Economics for Entrepreneurs podcast, which you can find on Apple Podcasts and other podcasting platforms and at Mises.org slash E4E, that'll get you there. It's exploratory. So our opening uh, episodes have been an alternate of professors like Per Byland and, and Peter Klein and others talking about economic theory and, and how to apply it. And then in the alternate weeks, practicing entrepreneurs who may never have heard of Austrian economics, but they'll tell us how they were successful, how they learned, when they weren't successful, how they recovered from that. So we've covered many, many categories with, with real life entrepreneurs. And 
every week we do what we call the, the key takeaways. So that's a business way of saying, hey, what are the learning points that we, we got in this episode? And we also have a free downloadable PDF that tries to capture that, that, that uh, you could pin on your wall or put in a drawer or at least uh, refer to. And now we've just produced our first ebook, which is a compilation of multiple episodes. Pear Byland always says, for the entrepreneur, if you understand the laws of economics and the mind of the customer, you'll be successful. So our first book is Understanding the Mind of the Customer. And it takes six of those episodes, six of those tools. And I, I will say I've used many of those tools in my consulting career. I've, I've worked on global brands in multiple countries using those self-same tools. So one of them, just to illustrate, is the means end ladder. So Austrian economic theory says that people are always acting in the pursuit of ends, and then they choose scarce means from from scarce means in, in order to achieve those ends. So that's theory. So you put that in practice. Now, if somebody buys my detergent or my car or my, my website, what are they trying to do? That's, that's the end. If they buy the Ferrari, are they trying to drive 150 miles an hour or are they trying to impress their neighbor? Those are the ends. You're trying to figure that out. And then why do they choose these means? And why don't they choose these other means? And can I persuade them to choose these other means? And so the means end ladder is the Austrian tool, and then we talk about how you apply that in, in real life. And we've got more tools like that, the, the brand framework tool, the customer journey mapping tool. You'll see them over time. And then eventually we'll add more online courses. We're, we're working on our first releases now. We hope to build eventually a community where entrepreneurs can come in and ask each other questions. Uh, maybe there'll be some mentorship there that we could offer. Maybe there'll be some service exchange. The, the lawyers can get marketing from the uh, the marketers, and the marketers can get legal help from the, the lawyers. So that, that's all to come. That's the future. So the podcast is the first step. We hope people will sign up, but think of it as a long engagement. Stay with us for a long time, and then please send ideas, send questions, send suggestions, send I wish. I used to have a tool, Jeff, when I was consulting. I, I called it IWIC, which stood for I wish I knew. So a wiki is what I what I know is. It's very assertive. But an IWIC is, hey, I wish I knew how this worked. Well, send us your IWICs and we'll try and respond. Well, Hunter Hastings, thanks so much for your time. We're going to put, ladies and gentlemen, links to not only the podcast, uh, but also the ebook, also the interview with Per Byland, and a couple of other uh, helpful links. This is the, the topic that I think we all have to be thinking about, no matter where we are in our careers, no matter where we are in life. Uh, the idea of a safe, comfy, uh, paid job with benefits and a pension is, is you know, quickly becoming uh, obsolete and something that a lot of us will never achieve. So we, we need to be educating ourselves and thinking along these lines. And Hunter, we appreciate so much your willingness to uh, roll up your sleeves and dive into this endeavor. Well, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. Appreciate all the support of the Mises Institute. And let me just reemphasize to anybody who might be listening, Please send along your ideas and suggestions. You can do that at the, the Mises.Business LinkedIn page or the Mises.Business Facebook page. Either, either one will get us. So thank you very much, Jeff. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.